Back in the early 2000s, me and my dad would stay up late as hell playing Nintendo 64. So Mario Kart 64, San Francisco Rush, Monster Truck Madness 64. I can sit here and go on forever listing off titles, but one game and one game alone held our attention for longer than any other, and that game is Battle Tanks Global Assault. But before I get into Global Assault, I wanted to talk about the first game briefly to give you an idea of just how much has improved between the two games. Battle Tanks was released by the 3DO company on December 29th 1998 exclusively for the Nintendo 64. Essentially, the story goes that in the distant future year of 2001, a virus has wiped out 99.9% .9 of the world's female population. So nations around the world have essentially decided to set up quarantine zones as a way to prevent their remaining women from becoming infected with the virus. The women that haven't been captured yet are referred to as Queen's Lords and are held by various gangs around the country. You play as a character named Griffin Spade, whose wife Madison decides to give herself up and join join the United States quarantine zone in San Francisco. So for the remainder of the game, you're on a quest to get her back. So you start in New York City and you'll work your way across the entire country fighting various gangs who have their own tanks as well. As far as I can tell, it's never really explained why everyone in a post-apocalyptic world is in a tank, besides the fact that everyone knows how to build them apparently and that's why there's so many. Right, okay. I want to highlight these cutscenes. They're really nothing special. There's no voice acting or anything, but I love the portraits. I mean, look at these guys. If that doesn't scream 1998, I don't know what does. Battle Tanks is broken up into 17 different levels where you'll be tasked with killing a certain number of enemies, capturing queen lords from other gangs, or crossing a heavily fortified bridge. After every two levels, you'll be given an opportunity to participate in a bonus level. In the bonus level, waves of enemy tanks come at you while you're expected to dispose of them without dying. As you progress further, you're score goes up and that contributes to your overall score at the end of the game. Battle Tanks is a pretty short game too, it took me just over two hours to complete, but it feels much longer than that. See, I played the second game Global Assault first, so going back to the original was definitely a huge downgrade in various ways. The first game only has one pilotable tank, the M1 Abrams, outside of the Goliath in the bonus stages. There's very little enemy variety as well, you'll mostly be fighting those Abrams and Goliaths, as well as turrets that the game loves to spam at you. Many of the campaign levels are just repurposed multiplayer stages where you're essentially just playing multiplayer levels against bots. Even worse, the game loves to spam enemies at you, especially on the Queen's Lord stages. So typically on these stages, you'll be tasked with having to not only defend your Queen's Lord, but also capture three more. This seems okay at the start since you have AI to defend your Queen's Lord, but do not waste time because once those AI are gone, it's you versus everyone else. So enemies will continue to spawn and continue to dick you down until you either give up or reset your progress. The Queen's Lord stages might be frustrating, but they pale in comparison to the bridge stages. These are beyond frustrating. The game's answer to increasing difficulty is just to throw more tanks and turrets at you. To feed you through choke points where you can't properly defend yourself, where you need to peek out quickly and fire off a shot. Those power-ups that are floating around the level, if you die with one of those in your possession, it doesn't respawn either. Once you've died in a level a few times, it's just you and your main gun, which is hilariously underpowered against some of those bigger turrets. And due to your tank's overall bulkiness, it's difficult to avoid those incoming shots. I found it easier to just get a few shots in, take the ill, respawn, and then try again with a full tank of health. If it sounds tedious, it's because it is. Any amount of variety would have helped the original battle tank stand out, but unfortunately that's all there is to it. At the end of the game, you meet up with Madison and your mission is complete. I briefly mentioned multiplayer earlier, and that's where the original battle tanks has some replayability. You have a few different modes to choose from, mostly the usual stuff, so deathmatch, team death match, capture the flag, etc. This allows for up to four player split screen with very minimal performance drops, which I was very impressed by. I can see myself back then playing this with my friends a lot, but knowing what I know about Global Assault and its multiplayer, I don't think I could realistically go back and play this for very long. The original Battle Tanks is a game I wouldn't recommend on its own. It's just too short and too tedious. But here's the thing, it's not all doom and gloom. This game led to a sequel that is so good. I'm willing to say it's the best Nintendo 64 game not made by Nintendo, and I stand by that. Battle Tanks Global Assault released on October 12, 1999 by the 3DO company on the N64. It was later released for the PS1 on March 14, 2000. To be clear, all of the footage I used to describe the game in this video will be from a real N64, whereas when I touch on the PS1 later on in the video, it'll be captured from a PS3. Now that that's out of the way, let's dive into Battle Tanks Global Assault. The game picks up right where the original Battle Tanks left off. Griffin Spade has 
reunited with Madison and you formed your own army to defend San Francisco with your son, Brandon. However, a woman named Cassandra sees your son and sees the potential in him. She sees that both Griffin and Madison have some sort of otherworldly ability called the Edge. And since they've reproduced, that means big things for the offspring, for Brandon. So she orders her army to kidnap Brandon and to kill everyone else. Griffin's army successfully repels her initial attack, but she successfully kidnaps Brandon and starts converting Griffin's own army against him using the Edge. Cassandra flees San Francisco, and so you're on a quest to get Brandon back. You'll travel across the US and parts of Europe to get him back. It's pretty cool seeing all of these iconic landmarks around the world with these big stupid tanks rolling through, blowing each other up. The cutscenes in this one are told in that same photo over text format, but they've toned down their appearances big time. The gangs still look goofy, but nothing compared to the previous game. Battle Tanks Global Assault will take you across 18 different stages, each with a unique look and layout unlike the first game, which reused assets and levels to pad the game out. They've also decided to drop the bonus stages, which I like a lot. It keeps the pacing of the game up and keeps you right in the meat of the game with little distractions. With that variety of level design, you also get a few different win conditions based on the mission itself. So you'll have conditions where you have to get to a certain part of the level, kill a certain number of tanks, and capture the Queen Lords like the first game. But they feel fresh because they aren't just reused multiplayer assets. In addition to these, there are certain parts of the game where you're defending a convoy as they pass through a level, or defending a beachfront against an amphibious invasion. It can be frustrating at times, but thankfully you have multiple ways of attack. The biggest improvement for me over the first game in Global Assault is the addition of different tanks in the single player campaign. So in addition to the Abrams and Goliath I described earlier, you also have six more tanks to play around with. As you progress through the campaign, more unlock and more become available to you. The Moto Tank is your first unlock. This little guy is extremely quick and nimble, but is the weakest of the bunch. The Rattler is my personal favorite. It's a bit chunkier and slower than the Moto Tank. However, it does far more damage with its gun, and I find that it's easier to maneuver around. The Inferno is just plain awful. It doesn't particularly excel at anything, and its primary weapon is a flamethrower. I only used it to counter the next tank, the Rhino. The Rhino has what I believe to be the largest health pool out of any of the tanks. The Goliath might have more, I'm not sure, but it has extremely dense and powerful armor on its front side, so as long as you're facing the Rhino, you're probably not destroying it without taking massive damage. The Rhino can easily be countered by the next two tanks, though, the Hover Tank and the Flippy Tank. The Hover Tank is really fast and hard to handle, but its main advantage is that it can fly over mines, which most of the time are strategically placed around the map to slow down your progress. The Flippy Tank is a weird one. It doesn't particularly excel at anything other than evasion. So if you press the left or right C buttons on the N64 controller, you'll flip the tank over in that direction, which is pretty cool in concept, but in my experience wasn't much more than a cheap party trick. Each tank has their own cost called tank bucks, and so you'll be balancing cost versus strategy for most of the game. There's no reason to spend 25 tank bucks on a Goliath if you need to catch up to a convoy, or no reason to keep buying 5 tank buck moto tanks if you're up against a bunch of heavy turrets. I quite like that aspect of the game, but that's not to say that the smaller tanks are useless either. Scattered around different levels are areas that are inaccessible by slower tanks, so you'll just need the turbo and teleport pickups as well as some patience with the rattler or the moto tank. So you want to line your tank up, hit the turbo button, and try to gently steer your tank into the area. Once you're in, pick up whatever is there and then use the teleport power up to get back out. There are also areas you can't access at all and have to get really lucky with the teleport power up, like on this level here with the projectors. 23 years later and I still can't figure out how to get the teleporter to teleport me inside those walls to get those tank books. There are plenty of pickups in Battle Tanks Global Assault that help you along your journey too. I mentioned three of them already, but you also have standard pickups like health and ammo as well as stars. Stars drop whenever you kill an enemy and they replenish a small amount of health and ammo. I suggest picking these up almost every time, as well as radar when you see it. Radar reveals the location of every NPC tank on the map, friend or foe, and makes the game that much easier for you. I don't want to spoil everything here, but some weapon pickups I found have an alternate use that might save you later on in the game. So, for example, the guided missile takes you out of the tank and allows you to steer the missile into whatever target you want. When I was getting low on tank bucks or if I was low on health, I'd use these is sort of a recon device to see what was ahead of me. The radar pickup is great and all, but it doesn't show you exactly what is ahead of you. It could be a bunch of tiny little moto tanks and rattlers or beefy goliaths that'll mess your day up. Some other excellent pickups are the grenades, which will allow you to take out entire minefields with a toss or two. I don't know what it is, but there's something I like about seeing those mines and bouncing beddies blow up in sequence like that.
Another thing I really liked was the game's soundtrack and its sound design in general. Hearing the tank treads rolling around the level, shells blasting out of various tanks while hard rock and metal music played behind me. Maybe it's just nostalgia blinding me, but I partially credit this game with getting me into this type of music. The game runs about two and a half hours long, which is pretty short, but it feels even shorter. You'll be flying through this game, and if you have a friend, you can also play the campaign entirely in split-screen co-op, which is a huge bonus for me. In addition to this, you're able to play competitive multiplayer with up to four players in split-screen. The modes on offer here are pretty much taken from the first game, but there's one chaotic mode in particular that's new, and that's Tank Wars. Tank Wars spawns your gang with a bunch of tanks that are faction-specific, and you have to kill more of the enemy than they kill of you. It's practically a team deathmatch, but the way the AI is, they all sort of just clump up into each other and fire indiscriminately. It's chaotic, and I love it. It can make for some really funny moments. And that's basically Battle Tanks Global Assault on the N64. It's a game that I can infinitely replay due to its short length and combat loop, but I wanted to take this time to talk about the PS1 version of Bit, which I've never played before making this video. I just wanted to preface by saying I have no horse in this race, I never did. I had an N64 growing up, but the PS1 has some really great standout titles too that I've grown to love as a teenager and now as an adult. Console Wars are silly and a good game is a good game regardless of what platform it's on. I have to say though that I was skeptical before I played this, but I'm pretty impressed by it now after having played it. I don't know if I'd even call it a port, it's almost like a reimagining or an expansion of the N64 game. The story essentially stays the same, but they've expanded on it quite a bit. There are entire missions that weren't on the N64 cartridge and they're mostly good. There's one I really enjoyed where you're driving around a base blowing up nuclear missiles because that's the best way to take them out obviously. It's so dumb, but so is the game and that's part of what I love about it. In addition to these missions, the PS1 version of the game features full motion video cutscenes and voice acting, which help to establish what kinds of people we're dealing with better than how the N64 presented them. The cutscenes are ugly, yeah, but I love them anyway. The soundtrack has also been redone where instruments sound more like their real life counterparts. I'll play some short clips comparing the two and let you decide which you like more. Personally, I'm going to go with the N64 just for the sheer fact that the PS1 soundtrack is more drowned out by the gameplay, but they're both excellent. Speaking on that gameplay, it hasn't changed too much, but what has changed, it's a mix of pros and cons. For example, I like that the game takes advantage of the dual shock and allows you to move the turret independently of the rest of the tank. That's great. However, I find that the camera feels so zoomed in now, it gets a bit disorienting when panning across the screen. This is also made worse by the performance issues, which strangely enough ran better on the N64. If you know anything about the N64, it's that its games typically don't run the greatest, and their PS1 counterparts were usually better. In this case though, I do prefer the N64 version, but I think if you grew up with the PS1 version, or if you're just looking for more Battle Tanks action, it's a competent addition to your collection. I think it's good. And I guess that just about does it. And so, with that, I will turn it over to you. Have you played Battle Tanks or its sequel? What are some of your favorite Nintendo 64 games? And with that, let's roll the outro. Thank you guys so much for watching, I really do appreciate your support. This was my first Nintendo 64 review with plenty more planned in the future. Keeping in the spirit of Nintendo, I'm going to go ahead and recommend my Conduit and Beautiful Joe videos. The Conduit is a motion controlled FPS for the Wii, and Beautiful Joe is a side scrolling beat em up for the GameCube. As always, have a good one.